We've entered into the spring holy day season and it's glorious. We've had some spring rains and today it's all, it's lovely and beautiful. The cherry trees are in bloom. The, the tulips are up. It's gorgeous. What a great, what a glorious spring. And this is, you know, at this time of the year, we're starting the annual holy day is a year with with this an incredible and some of the most important aspects that we put emphasis on, on what the Christian message is all about. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to read in the Coulter translation. Luke chapter 24 in the Gospels. Now, in the first day of the weeks, this is, of course, what he's talking about. <laughs> Many people don't understand. And what, uh, what Luke is talking about here is that this was the wave sheaf. This is the day you would start to count towards Pentecost. But you know, we're not going into that. But anyways, but now on the first day of the weeks, they came to the tomb at early dawn, bringing the spices they had prepared, and certain others came with them. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered it, they did not find the body of Jesus. And it came to pass that while they were puzzling over this, suddenly two men in shining garments stood by them. And as they bowed their faces to the ground, being filled with fear, they said to them, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Yes, these angels had come. And we're speaking to these disciples who had come to anoint the body of the crucified Jesus, whom they fully expected to find in the tomb. And the angels asked them this question, Why are you seeking the, the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember that he spoke to you while he was yet in Galilee, saying, It is necessary for the Son of Man to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and to be crucified, and to arise the third day. And they remembered his words. And after returning from the tomb, they related these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them. This is so a significant group of people who told these things to the apostles. But their words appeared to them as idle talk, and they did not believe them. They thought it was fake news. You know, they thought it was just, oh, these women, you know, they're getting emotional and whatever else. You know, they, a lot of people today, they hear this incredible story. They read this account in the gospel, and somehow, you know, they, they, it doesn't really affect them. It seems like idle talk. It just seems like, oh, well, you know, a guy rise from the dead. You know, this is crazy stuff. Who could believe this? Let's go down here to verse 13. Verse 13. And um, anyways, verse 12. Then Peter rose up and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying alone. And he went home wondering about the things that had come to pass. So Peter actually... He heard what the women said, you know, they, the, the women, they discounted it, but then Peter ran to the tomb. Actually, he also went with the Apostle John, but that's not in this particular account, which is part of the reason why you read all four Gospels. But anyways, and then he was saying, okay, the body of Jesus is not here. You know, there are a couple possibilities. And he put it, started thinking about it. And some of these times when, when you hear something that's remarkable, it's like you put it on, your, on the shelf. <coughs> And you wait for it to be explicated. You wait for the, the revelation or the understanding to come so you can understand what is this that I'm seeing. Verse 13. Luke goes on here in the, in the Gospel of Luke. Verse 13, And behold, on the same day, the same time when this happened, the women had come back from the tomb and had this experience with the angel, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, or Emmaus which was about 60 furlongs from Jerusalem. It was, a, you know, it was a decent walk. Not that far, but it was a decent walk. And they were talking to one another about all the things that had taken place. And it came to pass, as they were talking and reasoning, 
because <laughs> you know it was a, it was an incredible experience. This whole thing of the arrest, conviction, and execution of Jesus, and the, the just destruction of what they thought was the movement that God was doing to bring to pass his prophecies and they had seen these powerful works of healing and they'd heard the preaching of Jesus and they had been moved and now it all seemed to, like a balloon that had been pricked and it all seemed to go <laughs> Some ways a lot of people think today that the prophecies of God and what the Bible has to say, you know, that it's just <laughs> You, you, th you know, you, you, we, we heard about this whole thing this past week of Notre Dame Cathedral being burned. And they, you know, one of the things that comes out is how few people in Europe still believe in the gospel from this aspect. How few people believe in the gospel. Anyways, so they were talking with one another about these things, these two guys who were on the road to a mouse. And it came to pass as they were talking and reasoning that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. They, they didn't recognize him when he came up with them. And he said to them, What are these words you are exchanging with one another as you walk? And why are you downcast in countenance? You know, he, you know, you can see it. They, they, these, these men were profoundly moved by what they had experienced in Jerusalem over the past few days. Then the one named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you only traveling through Jerusalem and have not known of the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, you know, here's, here's, here's the leading question. Okay, this is one of those open-ended questions. Okay, I want you guys to talk about this. What things? And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, a man who was a prophet, who was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. You see, it wasn't just that Jesus preached and gave the, you know, spoke the word of God. You see, I'm preaching, I'm speaking the God, word of God, but he was different. He had a special commission and he did mighty deeds of power, healings raising people from the dead, healing the blind and the sick, all sorts of things like this. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the judgment of death and crucified him. Well, you can see here very clearly that those who exercise power in this world don't want to have that power threatened. They don't want anyone taking away that power power and Jesus was what he was saying was upsetting the status quo is upsetting the status quo among the religious people of his own community but it was in it as well as the Romans verse 21 and we were hoping that he was the one who would redeem Israel but besides all these things, as of today, the third day has already passed since these things took place. In other words, his being seized and his midnight trial and his beating and execution. Verse 22, And also certain women from among us astonished us after they went to the tomb early. For when they did not find his body, they came to us, declaring that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he is living. And some, of the, and some of those with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, <laughs> Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. <laughs> you know, oh, foolish, you don't believe the Bible? You don't believe the message of the Bible? Oh, foolish, he was saying. And th these were people who read the Bible all the time. How much more here in the 21st century where, you know, of course, most people aren't familiar at all. And, of course, they discount all of our leaders these days, more so than even back then, discount the message of the Bible and the teachings of the Bible. Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ, that is, the Messiah, this was a specific you know, the whole concept of Messiah was value-laden. It had context. It had meaning. It, you know, it throughout the entire uh, word of God of what it was promising. 
Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and from all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. Things that were, you know, that had been said many centuries earlier. This is one of the remarkable proofs of the Bible in the context and the validity of the word of God that so many in our current 21st century completely overlook. They don't even bother thinking about it. They just dismiss us out of hand. And as they approached the village where they were going, he appeared to be going farther. But they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is declining. No, it's, it's getting late. You know, you know, you don't want to be on the road by yourself. It could be dangerous. Just like today, you know, just traveling by yourself. A man or a woman, people disappear, you know. And he entered it as if to stay with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at table with them, they had gone into a you know, wayside end, and they were having something to eat. He took the bread, and this would have been flat bread, unleavened bread, because these were the days of unleavened bread, according to the scriptures. So he took the bread and blessed it, and after breaking it, okay, it was a break. You weren't tearing it because it wasn't leavened. You broke it, you know, matzos. In breaking it, he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he disappeared from them. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn with us as he was speaking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? Yeah, it was like, you know, hey, we're part of the inside group and this guy is coming along and telling us all these things of what this means and how we're wrong and why we were lacking faith and all this stuff. They were probably sitting there, you know, they were a bit chafing at this, you know, and they were saying, he's, he's, you know, he's telling us this, that, and the other. Well, I knew that, but he, no, I, why didn't I get that? You know, whatever it was, all these different things, their reaction, you know, they were, you know, Jesus was teaching them and, you know, they were human beings and they, you know, there was a sort of a bit of burning within them. There was a sort of negative reaction to who's, you know, they had these other things going on at the same time that they were listening to him. But they, these men were sufficiently morally upright that they were willing to listen while Jesus was saying these things, they didn't know it was Jesus, of course, while he was saying these things and taking it in, and they just didn't shut him down. See, a lot of people today just shut people down. They won't listen. You tell them even the truth, if they still don't listen or believe or turn. You see this very clearly in the attitudes of people today, you know. The man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, and that's what's going on politically in the United States of America these days, you know, with the whole thing of the Mueller report or anything else. It's, it's a human problem. Did not our hearts burn within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? They rose up that very hour <laughs> and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were assembled together. So the remaining disciples, remember Judas had killed himself. And then, then the other disciples, you know, a couple, you know, there were less than 200 people there, maybe 120 or so. This is what the scriptures would indicate. Saying, in truth, the Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. Okay, Simon was one of, I assume Simon was one of the fellow. You had Cleopas and then Simon, and it was probably Cleopas who was talking. Then they related these things that they had happened on the road and how he had made known to them by the breaking of bread. And as they were telling these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. Peace be to you. Well, you know, at that point in time, you know, they were terrified because, you know, as, as, just as they had been some of the disciples, other times when Jesus had done remarkable things like coming to them when they were on the ship in the Sea of Galilee and the storm had come up and he came walking on the water. He was, he, Jesus did things that people didn't expect. Things that weren't possible for a human being. And sometimes, 
And just as it would with you or me right now, it would terrify him. But he said, peace be with you. Uh, with you. And then he, made, he gave them proofs that he had indeed been resurrected from the dead. He was not just a spirit. He had, you know, he had a body, he had a bones, he could eat food. And he did this in front of them to show them. And then let's go down to Luke chapter 24 and verse uh, 44. And then he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything which has been written about me, everything that has been written about me in the law of Moses and, you know, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, that is to say, when you talk about the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, you're talking about all of the Old Covenant scriptures. Some people refer to it as the Old Testament, but the Hebrew Bible. All these things that have been written about me must be fulfilled. Well, a lot of people today who think of themselves as Christians think, well, it's all been fulfilled. No, it has not. Anyone who's familiar and actually pays, you know, does bothers to read the Bible, reads, realizes there's a lot more that's coming. There's a lot more that's coming. Let's turn with me to Psalm 110 here for a second. Let's just take a look. I want to illustrate this point that a lot of people overlook right now. And this is highly pertinent for us who are living in the 21st century. As we're coming here, this year, this is 2019 according to the Roman calendar, you know, we are uh, all about 11 years from the 2000th year anniversary of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're coming up here in 11 years to the 2000 years. Anyways, let's take a look here. Psalm 110, what sort of things, everything Jesus said that has been written about me in the scriptures are, must be fulfilled. That's not, you know, it's not maybe or could be. No, it's must be fulfilled. Psalm, I'm going to read one of these things that must be fulfilled. Psalm 110, New Living Translation. It's a Psalm of David, the shepherd king of Israel. The Lord, and this is YHVH, okay, the, the, the I, great I am, or the ever living one, as far as what, it's, uh, what it stands for, the one who's self-existent. The Lord said to my Lord, different Hebrew word, the word here is Adonai, which meant Lord, someone who had a position, a high position of authority, and someone's and David here, who is king of Israel, is acknowledging him as his Lord. So, you know, David was a sovereign, and he's acknowledging somebody else as his sovereign. Okay, you get the picture here. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. What is he saying? You know, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, there's another place in scripture. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. We'll be back to Psalm 110, by the way. Put, stick a ribbon or, you know, put a little note or, you know, something in that. We'll be back to it in just a second. But Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, Amplified Bible version. I kept looking, the prophet Daniel, in the writings of the prophets, he's saying, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, on the clouds of heaven, one, like a son of man, was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Jesus himself had given the high priest this image. He had cited this scripture. This was the reason when he cited the scripture, this is why they put him to death. He cited the scripture and bang, that, that it, you know, flipped the switch, as it were, oh. And to him, that is the Messiah, was given dominion. That means supreme authority. He this one who came up to uh, the Son of Man, who came before the Ancient of Days, who was presented to him. And to him, the Son of Man, this, the, the Messiah, was given dominion, meaning supreme authority, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and speakers of every language should serve and worship him. That means everybody. That was going to be, you know, that they should serve and worship him, which is not the state of our world right now by any means. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It is an everlasting supreme authority. If you don't find that right now. Which is not, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It's not going to be like ancient Israel or Syria or Egypt or Babylonia, which have disappeared. Those kingdoms are gone. And it's not going to be like the governments here in Canada, the United States of America or Britain or wherever you might be, Germany or China or Japan. No. It's not going to, you know, he's, he, he, you know, all these governments, all human governments pass away. That is a story of history. The United States of America, Canada, you know, where we live right now, we like to think everything is permanent. No, it's not. It's a period of time in the story of, of mankind, of history. But there is coming one, the Son of Man, who is presented in the ancient days, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It is an everlasting dominion, the kingdom of God. So if we go back here to Psalm 110 again. So the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor and the right hand till I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. And many people make themselves and set themselves as the enemies of the Son of Man right now. They teach contrary. They hate those who, pro, you know, who profess or try to teach his morals and ethics. Anyways, the Lord will extend your powerful kingdom. That's Psalm 110, verse 2. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Zion, meaning Jerusalem. You know, we know where that is in the Middle East. This is not an unknown place. The Lord will extend your kingdom from Zion, Jerusalem, and you will rule over your enemies. This is the future. It's, it's, you know, this is, you know, prophecy is a, is a future. It's a newscast of what's coming in soon down the pike, down the road. When you go to war, your people will serve you willingly. Oh, the Messiah is going to go to war? Returned Christ is going to go to war? Well, anyone who reads the Bible and looks at the book of Revelation knows, you know, that it just talks about this, right? You are arrayed in holy garments, and your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. And yeah, the morning dew, this is a you know the good the the symbol that David is putting here in, in a dry desert area, uh, like you have much of the the land of Israel in the in the Middle East, or if you go any desert of the world, California, wherever you might, Arizona. You know it's the dew in the morning that keeps so many of the plants alive. It renews. It's a strengthening thing. It's a, this the image. Verse four: The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. He will strike down many kings. He will strike down many kings like he did to Pharaoh, who was the ruler of the superpower of his that time in the 1400s BC during the 18th, 18th dynasty in Egypt. He will strike down many kings when his anger erupts. He will punish the nations. You think of the Exodus story with the ten plagues. Yeah, he, you know, you know, we're, you know, this is the idea. He will punish many nations and fill their lands with corpses. See, we just had, the, you know, the, the Passover, which symbolized, you know, that night you had to put the blood of the lamb on the lintels of the door houses so the death angel would pass over you. But the Egyptians that did not believe and uh, who, who were idolaters and worshipped all the idols of Egypt, you know, their firstborn all the way from Pharaoh to the humblest, you know, servant in the, you know, who would grind the grain in the, 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 the local households, the Egyptian households. Those firstborns would all die. I will punish the nations and fill their lands with corpses. He will shatter the heads over the whole earth, but he himself will be refreshed from brooks along the way. He will be victorious. So we see here very clearly that the scriptures, when Jesus came, and he came to open the minds of the people, to help them understand, you know, that all the things as he said, you know, as he was making, 
He said, everything that has been written about me in the law of Moses and the writings of prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. This is what he was saying in Luke 24 and in chapter 40, in verse 44. Verse 45 here in Luke 24. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He, you know, sometimes, really in many aspects, opening the scriptures so that you know that you know it, you understand, and you know you understand, is a spiritual act. And Christ did that with his disciples. I know he did it with me. You know, when I, you know, when I was a young person, I would read the scripture. Sometimes I'd read, and you know, yes, you can understand sometimes words, but I mean to really understand what he's saying and to understand that his word, that God is speaking to you through his word, that is sometimes it's a spiritual gift that, you know, that, you know, in this case, Christ opened their minds, the minds of his disciples to understand the scriptures. And he said, so it is written that the Christ, that is the Messiah, the anointed one, would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance, which is, you know, needed repentance, uh, the repentance necessary for forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem, from Zion. What Christ was saying to the disciples is there right at the time. He appeared to them when they first understood the reality of his resurrection from the dead and fulfilling the scriptures, the beginning of the fulfillment of all things that were, were, were written about him. They were told that, you know, that this repentance for forgiveness of sins would be preached. And this is the job of the church. Repentance is the first prerequisite for receiving the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it, this, it was a focal point uh, in the, that first sermon that the Apostle Peter gave on Pentecost, that, that first Pentecost after Jesus' death and, and resurrection, which is, of course, the birth date of, of the Christian church, of the church of God. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Jesus told his disciples, mandated, commissioned them. The repentance, you know, it's necessary for forgiveness of sin must be preached. When it's, going, it's going to be preached. And of course, and Peter was starting to fulfill it. Acts 2, 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there was an exhortation and there was he, not only to repent, which we'll talk about in a moment, and which would be followed by action. Yes, you must be baptized. Baptizico, it's you know, immersion in water. It's not sprinkling, it's immersion in water. That's the example that's given, you know, John the Baptist, Jesus himself, that's, that's the example we're given. Repent and be baptized in Jesus Christ's name. Something that people who are in other faiths might have a difficulty with, but it takes repentance and before. Anyways, for, if forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's promised that they're receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit, and if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're not Christians. We're not really His. We must have the Holy Spirit. It says when this word um, repent, it's Strong's 3340. Metanoeo, metanoeo. It means, in the way the lexicon defines it, this Greek word, metanoeo, is to change one's mind or purpose on account of something. In this case, on account of the Word of God, what the Bible says. To think differently, to reconsider morally, and to, you know, to feel motivated and convicted by what one reads so that you take action. Peter, again, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ. The work of the apostles is, in one sense, a continuation, of course, 
of the earlier work of, the, of, of John the Baptist. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, Amplified Bible Version here, I'll quote. In those days, that is, you know, in those days when, at that time when John the Baptist was preaching, many people were expecting the Messiah to, to appear because the scriptures seemed to indicate the time frame that when they would read the prophecies in Daniel, you know, the 70 days, 70, you know, uh, you know, 70 weeks prophecy, you know, the... They sort of, they would calculate, says, okay, it's, it's, we're really close to it one way or the other. I don't care, you know, there were, there were obviously different ways that people would count and look at it. Do we count from this? Do we count from that? Because we know very clearly they were expecting the Messiah to show up. But first, what you have is this other guy. John the Baptist shows up. God sends John the Baptist. And what is why? It says... Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That means along the western side of the Dead Sea, which if you've ever tra traveled to the land of Israel, you know that that is it's, it's a low, one of the lowest space spots on earth, and it is very, very hot whenever you start to get into spring and summer. I mean, it cooks. Here, preaching in the wilderness of jail, and it's still a fairly desolate area. And saying, so John appeared preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, which is an amplified notes here, the amplified Bible. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. Live your way in a life that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he said. We, you know, we already read in Daniel 7 and, and Psalm 110, the kingdom of God is a core of the, of the biblical scriptural message. It's not going to heaven, you know, your soul laughed off to heaven when you died. No, it's the coming of the kingdom of God. It's a resurrection from the dead. This is the message of the Bible. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different in some ways from what a lot of people think it is. But if you take the scriptures for what they say, and Jesus said that all things you know, must be fulfilled, you know, we're looking at you know, something that is really rem remarkable for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, you know, the king of heaven is now confirmed. He is ratified. He is in the position to act when he decides, when the Father decides that it's time to pull the trigger and change everything. Repentance, that change of heart and will. You know, it's, 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 uh, and baptism is that outward right of, this, of a purification, forgiveness, forgiveness of sin. So when he would baptize, he was doing something that they would understand because they knew... You know, they had, they were familiar with that if you were going up to the temple, you had to be ritually clean. You had to go to a mikvah and have your sins washed away. When a woman had a, finished her period, she would go to the mikvah to be clean. So she would, they had this, all this understanding that, you know, that purification was necessary of the body. But also, and Jesus would make this point very clearly, it was also of the heart and the mind the will, the desire that you have as a person. This is one of the things you would argue about with the, with the Pharisees all the time. They liked, you know, the idea of, of purification by rituals, but Jesus talking about repentance, change. And it was, you know, it was, it was something that was in this whole idea of repent and believe the gospel is, is, is directly connected to receiving the Holy Spirit, which makes us part of God's adopted children, part of his family, as the, as the Gospels will later reiterate. reiterate. Repentance is the first of the, of the six elemental truths of God's, you know, of what, what you know, later on in the scriptures is called God's elemental truths of the word. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. 
And I'll read this in the New Living Translation. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> I believe it was Paul who was writing this. There's not an author attributed, but anyways, and I think he was doing this while he was under sort of house arrest or protective custody is probably a better state in Caesarea when at that time when he had gone, uh, that different part of the book of Acts. Anyways, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. And sometimes this is, this is, this is a, a powerful exhortation. For there's some people who just, you know, about the, you know, the basic teachings of Christ, they repeat them over and over and over again, and they don't go on and become mature in their understanding. Part of the, you know, the purpose of the Judeo-Christian Foundation and what we're doing here on the COG webcast is to help you to become mature in your understanding. You know, being a Christian is a lot more than just say, I believe, you know, I accept Christ as my Savior. It's, it's, it's much more than that, I, I, I try to emphasize. The apostle again says, let us stop going over the basic teachings of Christ again and again. Let's go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. Do we? Do we have to go over? You know, the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. What are evil deeds? Evil deeds, you know, if you, if you, you compare a number of uh, versions and they'll, they'll tell you, you know, from this aspect in some of their notes, it, acts that lead to death, also known as dead works. Dead work? What are dead works? Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. Okay, sin, you know, dead works, what we do, are the work we do, if it's sinful, it results in death. And, and the scriptures, you know, the Paul would later, you know, the, the juxtaposition would be then the free, but the free gift of God, the wages of what we do are, you know, our, our dead works results in death, our sin, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, Messiah, Jesus. Again, identifying Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah Jesus, our Lord. Our Kyrios, our Adonai, just as David said, <laughs> the Lord said to my Adonai. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Anyways, that explains that. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord? If he says he's your Lord, he's, he's our boss more so than any physical boss you've ever had. So surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds, dead works, sinful works, things that lead to death, and placing our faith in God. Surely we don't need to do that, do we? Don't, you don't need further instruction about baptisms. These are the cleansing rites that they were a bit familiar with, the mikvahs, you know, the things that they would do. The laying on of hands, which is how, what we do after baptism, you know, and for ordination. The resurrection of the dead. Yes, that's what is the hope. It's not that we have an immortal soul when we waft off to heaven when we die. No, it's the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. God, you know, provides us for the saints, eternal judgment's a good thing because it means we are given eternal life. For the wicked, it's bad news. <laughs> it means there's a destruction. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. Verse 4, I want you to notice this. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come. See, they've given an advanced experience, an advanced experience of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. You know, when you come into the church, you have a, 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 a little taste of what it's going to be like in the kingdom of God. A little bit of taste. 
because you've had the Holy Spirit. You know what it's done in your life and the peace it gives, the hope, the strengthening. It was impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. And verse 6, who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. Then the scriptures go on to say, by rejecting the Son of God, God has a Son, contrary to what Muhammad thought, by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding them up to public shame. So if we make a profession as a Christian, we repent and are baptized, have hands laid on us and receive the Holy Spirit and then turn away from it, turn away from God, we're in trouble. Because scripture says it's impossible to bring such people back to repentance. Because it makes the point by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. It's just like they were the original guys who nailed Jesus to the Christ cross, who engineered his death. We become one of those by denying him, turning our backs on him. Verse 7, when the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. You know, every year when the farmers go out to plant, you know, they hopefully they'll get this rain in due season. They need that for the crops to grow. We need the rain. A lot of city people, city folks, they, they don't think about the fact that, you know, why are they alive? They're alive because, you know, we get the ground, we get rain in due season and the crops grow. They're disconnected from the fun, some of the basics of reality, but we shouldn't be. But, but then it makes this point, verse 8, this is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, after it's been rained on, you know, this, this sort of like the pouring, the nurturing, the washing of God's word, it is useless. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. It says, the farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. And one of the things and I used to do at my, my dad's little ranchette that he had there, in Idaho, when I'd come to visit, you know, Dad, I'd show up and Dad had a list of, you know, son do things, you know. <laughs> I need this done and that, done that, whatever. And so I'd just start to get busy, <laughs> you know, the things Dad wanted me to do. And one of the things oftentimes was getting out his propane burner and burning the thorns and thistles. <laughs> so they don't produce extra seeds, and if they got seeds, you burn them up too. See, the idea of you, when you burn the thorns and thistles, you don't want it infecting your field. You want it to be productive. Eventually, you know, and it says that you gather the thorns and thistles and then you burn them. This is an agricultural, you know, principle that a lot of city folks don't, don't understand anymore. Repentance is an essential doctrine, according to the scriptures. Central to the gospel. God calls on all humans to repent. We all have something to repent of. Maybe we have to look for it sometimes. Maybe sometimes it's, you know, it's as evident as the nose on our face. We understand it. People are all different. They have different backgrounds, different experiences, but there's, you know, there's not a single one of us that hasn't sinned. Scriptures make that point. Let's go to Acts 17.30. <clears throat> Luke, who was writing Acts, makes this point. He captures this. He's capturing, you know, what, what the Apostle Paul, one of his one of his uh, one of his sermons, he said, Therefore God overlooked and disregarded the former ages of ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. As Amplified notes, repent, that means to change their old way of thinking, to regret their past sins, and to seek God's purpose in their lives. Now, God overlooked it, but now he commands everyone to repent. See, this is where we are in, in humanity right now. We are asked to repent. What does repentance mean? What should one repent of? Well, what one should repent of is varies according to the person. Sometimes you have to counsel, you have to reflect. Repentance, of course, we've, we've already seen some of it, you know, because I've given you the definition. 
to change your old way of thinking, to regret, you know, past mm -hmm. things when you missed the mark, where you didn't do, you weren't seeking God's purpose in your <laughs> life, maybe? How do you tell the difference between real and counterfeit repentance? Well, because there can be counterfeit repentance. Repentance should be total change. I've, I've seen a lot of people, I'm not a lot, a few. <laughs> For, yeah, I'm not going to say a lot. You know, there are a lot of people here on the face of this earth, and I've only had the privilege of knowing a few or the, or the misfortune of knowing a few of them. But anyways, repentance means turning from sin. And there are some people who approach religion, they approach Christianity as though they think it's, you know, I say the magic phrase, you know, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and, you know, that gets them into heaven, they think, or they, they perform these things, or they go to communion or mass or whatever it might be, and they think that guarantees them a place there. But while God is asking that everyone sh and everywhere should repent. He has something in mind. He has something in mind of what's critical to reestablish this relationship between our Creator, the Creator of this world, the Creator of you and uh, our lives, and Himself. God is a holy God. And what does he want us to repent of? Well, some things are, he makes it very clear and evident, although, you know, there are lots of religious people who do their utmost to obfuscate this, just as there were in Jesus' time. Repentance, you know, a fact about repentance, primary, is that is a change of mind and behavior. And that means specifically turning from sin. What is sin? A lot of people don't know what's sin. A lot of Christians don't know what's sin. They will, you know, put around. But the Bible gives you a definition of sin. You don't have to guess. It does actually say. Let's go to 1 John, in the general epistles of the Apostle John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And I'll read it here. 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who practices sin... It's a practice, just like music practice. You do it over and over again. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing, the. they say it's equivalent of practicing lawlessness. And the Bible defines very clearly what is the law of God. You know, that's what you have. Let's go on to maturity. It's not just be simpletons and fools. You know, we have, the, the Bible explains in the first five books what we sometimes call the Torah, the teaching, or the Pentateuch, it explains, you know, about, you know, you know, you shall not, you know, not murder. You're not to commit adultery. You're not to covet. You should, you know, have no other God before the, 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 the Lord God of the Bible. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Anomia in Greek. Anomia. Sin is lawlessness. And yeah, I find out the art. It's um, incredible how many, you know, people who think of themselves as Christians are every day running around practicing sin. And you know, they because they don't understand that's connected to the Word of God. God defines what sin is. It's not a, he's not leaving it up to our imagination. You know, many are willfully blind of this so the simple statement in 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. And God expects us not to continue in that. That's one of the things we must repent of, of breaking the word of God, of being idolaters. And this world is, is idolatrous. Most people in this world are idolatrous. They substitute their own opinions and emotions for the word of God, defining what is right and what is wrong in their behavior and their actions. Jesus said this, Matthew 7, verse 13, prophesying not only of his time, but of, of our time. Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 13, Read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Enter through the narrow gate, for 
wide is the road, the gate is wide and the road is broad, that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. The majority, overwhelming majority. Verse 14, how narrow is the gate and how difficult is the road that leads to life and few that find it. <clears throat> that is not what a lot of people think. But that's what Jesus said. And then he makes the point here, Matthew 13, 40, there are consequences to those who practice sin. Matthew 13, verse 40, therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, that I was talking about earlier about the thorns and the thistles, so it will be at the end of the age. See, that's future. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather from his kingdom, gather out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, whatever deceitful, enticing mind traps and philosophies and false religious ideas people might have. You'll gather out of his kingdom whatever those that causes sin, the scandal on, and those who are practicing lawlessness. Verse 42, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation talks about the, you know, the lake of fire, you know, volcano, you know, type of thing. We're just physical beings. It is true that repentance means turning to righteousness as motivated by a sincere faith that expresses a thorough, you know, a willingness to, to obey God. Turning from willful blindness to willful obedience, if you would, okay? From that, from that standpoint. Many of the commandments of God are stated or framed in the, you know, sort of thou shalt not form, but there are also lots of commandments that are stated in the positive affirming, the, you know, this is what you should do in exhorting us. And one of those is, and I would point out, in fact, it is the first commandment and overwhelming is framed totally in a positive way. Because some, a lot of people, you know, critics, will say, oh, it's the thou shalt not, okay, God. No, what God really wants, and it's first on his mind, is this. Luke 10 and verse 25, Amplified Bible version. And a certain lawyer, you know lawyers, don't you? <laughs> oh, they're the same way there, now as they were 2,000 years ago, you know. But this guy was an expert in the word, the Mosaic law, okay. So he was looking, you know, it's just like now if you have a, a lawyer who's in a tax, so they're looking for every way, every loophole they can find, anything they can reason around and make their case. A certain lawyer stood up to test him. So you got his attitude right there saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, I'm a minimalist. I want the minimum amount, what, you know, like, you know, Jesus is my savior. That's a minimalist amount. And that's all I have to do is say, and, and I feel I have faith somehow and that's it, right? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? That's not maybe, well, that may be the answer he was expecting, but that's not the answer most people these days are expecting. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27, he replied, you shall love, positive frame, you shall love the Lord your God. How are you going to do this? With all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and in, while we're at it, <laughs> your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I missed anything here, <laughs> I've got to, you, you see, you can't just be religious and treat your neighbor like dirt. And there are a lot of religious people who treat others in the church, especially, you know, if they feel that they're beneath them or don't have the same position in the church or whatever, they'll treat them like dirt think they can get away with it, or there are a lot of people who do this these days. No. And your neighbor as yourself. So, you, you know, God expecting that level of love for God. You know, it's all-encompassing. And, we, by the way, we can't just say, yeah, I'm religious because I love God and I do all these great things, but I do all these nasty things to my neighbors. You know, big CEO of some major corporation ripping off, you know, all the, all the employees and the pensioners and pocketing, raping and pillaging the, the corporate funds so the place has to go bankrupt and they end up with nothing. Anyways, we have lots in these days. 
people don't love their neighbors as themselves. Jesus said to um to this lawyer who asked him, "What's you know what must I do to inher inherit eternal life?" And he said, and Jesus said, "What does the law say?" And of course it is. He knew it to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, "You have answered correctly. Do this habitually, and you will live." Of course, if you go here to where I'm citing this, uh, Luke 10, 25, you'll see that this guy wanted to justify himself because he wasn't loving his neighbor. <laughs> so repentance is not just stopping bad behavior also. You know, it is positive. It means doing and thinking right things, treating people right, things that are pleasing in God's sight. God's not just looking at little liturgies, sacraments you know we have this we have this stuff we do and that's going to please god it's, that's the way the pagans approach their gods it's not what god wants pens begins with a change of mind that results in lifestyle changes followed up with action a lot of people can, can use lifestyle change these days because it's not in accordance with the scriptures they try and substitute things that aren't you know virtual signal well, I'm righteous because I'm this, that, and the other. I do this. You know, we have this whole thing going on, but there's, they don't refer to the Word of God as the authority to determine what is right or wrong by any means. They're idolatrous. They want to do whatever they think their philosophy is. This idea, you know, when John the Baptist appeared before Jesus, you know, God thought, you know, Jesus as a Messiah, he needed an advanced man. He needed, you know, you know, an advanced man is somebody who goes into an area. We, they do it in politics. They send somebody out there to beat up the drums to get people to come out for the candidate so he can come and speak and make best use out of his time. They also do that for promotion for any sort of event, you know, rock concerts or anything else. They have advanced men. Well, John the Baptist was Jesus' advanced man. And John was coming to challenge hypocrites, all those who wanted to, you know, virtue signal that they were better than others, because he was, to tell, he was telling them to bring forth fruits of repentance. Let's go to John, uh, excuse me, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 10. Gospel of Luke 3, 10, New Living Translation. The crowds asked, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. You can't just lie in your pockets. And, what you, uh, and some soldiers asked, what should we do? John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations. Be content with your pay. Plenty of false accusations. People like to do that now, too. Of course, there are all sorts of examples of those who wouldn't bring forth fruits of repentance. You know, this time of year, you know, you have the whole story in Exodus of Pharaoh. Moses come, you know, let my people go, and he wouldn't. Did you go through with this whole thing? This was a typical, this was a prime example of somebody who would not bring forth fruits of repentance. <laughs> it was Pharaoh. Paul reiterated that Christians, we need to be doing works befitting of repentance. And that's what he, that is what he cited. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 12, he has his whole account, which he's accounting to some of the political leaders of his day. And he gives us light that when he had, you know, this is his famous on the road to Damascus thing. We still like to use you know, this phrase, I had my road to Damascus experience when it changed me. And, but, you know, he, Paul says, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language. You know, Jesus liked to speak Hebrew. <laughs> you know, Paul was an educated guy. He knew Hebrew, not just the Aramaic, you know. So, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. 
And, and what does the scriptures mean? These goads were wooden shafts. They are like broomsticks with pointed pieces of metal on one end. And it was used by farmers commonly in that day to keep an ox going the right direction as it pulled a plow. Jesus was prodding Paul, then Saul, to take the proper direction in his life, and Paul had been resisting. I guess that this wasn't the first time. Finally, Jesus says, this guy is a hard case, but I want him. So he had the road to Damascus thing. He concludes, you know, and, and, and Paul did in, in this account here in Acts 26, he said, so, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. <laughs> Paul decided that this was, this was enough for him. He knew, that, you know, he, he couldn't, you know, he wasn't going to be willfully blind. He wasn't dishonest with himself. He wasn't believing, you know, lies that he would tell himself. A lot of people will believe their own lies, and this is very, very dangerous. Never lie to yourself. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, where he was, and those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And what did he preach to all these different people? That they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance, to show that they actually had repented. If you say, I repent, and you continue to practice sin, in the way the Bible defines it, you're not sincere and you're not fooling God. Repentance fully involves the internal and external qualities of our beings. It's about our attitudes. Because our attitudes influence our actions. Putting God's teachings into action requires, you know, some perseverance. It requires having the attitude to begin with it. You know, if we're going to do what pleases God, if we're going to practice righteousness, do these things, we have to have, you know, we have to be, we have the attitude of loving God and loving our neighbor so that we're willing to do what is actually good and right. Christ, real Christianity is an action religion. You know, just, just turn with me here. It's, since this is the season, let's go to it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, 8. It is commonly reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. So this was of that time, and you know the Greco-Roman society were pretty sexually immoral. You know, we we're pretty sexually immoral right now in the 21st century too. But you know the yeah, and they're all and you compare it to the scriptures, and the scriptures are pretty explicit in this. It's not leaving it up to our imagination. But Paul said. It says Christianity is an action religion. First Corinthians chapter five and verse four. And Paul said to the church, the brethren in Corinth, he said, "In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are gathered together in my spirit, uh, and my spirit together with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver this this person who's among you, who's saying he's a Christian, and yet you know he's doing this sexual sin, whatever it might." He said, "Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh." It means not good times. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know, when, when he comes and brings his kingdom and will evaluate and, and judge his servants and reward those, you know, according to their works, whether they're good or whether they're bad. Then he goes on, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, the scriptures say, For your glory is not good. Yeah, they thought they had been tolerant, you know. They, they were allowing sexual diversity in their midst. Your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Oh, wait a minute. We're talking here, a baking analogy, a little leaven. Leavens the whole lump. Sure, we know that's all true. Therefore, he, Paul is saying, purge out the old leaven. 
This is the leaven of sin and malice, so that you may become a new lump even as you are unleavened. Oh, the Corinthian brethren were unleavened. They were practicing the days of unleavened bread. For Christ, our Passover, not our Easter bunny, was sacrificed for us. For this reason, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christianity is a religion of action. This time of year, when we think of this, let us keep the feast, the keeping the feast of unleavened bread. We do this because Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He gave his life that we might be redeemed, and he calls us to repentance that he might forgive us our sins. We be baptized and should receive hands laid on and receiving the Holy Spirit. It's a remarkable period of time. Let us think of these things this time of year when we have such a wonderful cloud of witnesses in the scriptures to exhort us and know how we love God and our neighbor in a way that is pleasing to God.